Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My guest today is Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, a company who provide research, analysis and paralegal services around environmental and energy issues. Arnie Gunderson has 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience and during his nuclear industry career, Arnie managed and coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the United States. He currently speaks on television, radio and at public meetings on the need for a new paradigm in energy production. An independent nuclear engineering and safety expert, Arnie provides testimony on nuclear operations, reliability, safety and radiation issues to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and of officials throughout the US, Canada and internationally. Arnie Gunderson, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Hi, thank you for having me, Helen. Well, Arnie, things are going from bad to worse, right, at Fukushima? Uh, they're certainly not getting any better. But and Arnie, I... Arnie, they, did they know right at the beginning that, that there was a meltdown within the first few hours in Unit 1? Did they sit on that data and cover it, or did they not know? I think um, there, there's three agencies involved. I think the, uh, the Japanese on the scene wanted to believe the best. Yeah. And I've seen that at Chernobyl, and I saw that at, uh, at Three Mile Island. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you have two instruments, one is awful and one is good, you believe the one that's good. Uh, but pretty quickly, I think at, at management levels, they knew things were really bad. But moving up the chain through the government became a real problem there. The, the, the second agency involved was the IAEA, the International Atomic Agent, Energy Agency, mm -hmm. and, and they have a charter to promote nuclear power. So uh, I don't think we were going to get a very um, strong statement out of them early on. And then the last one is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it's now apparent that they knew and didn't tell. Why? Um, why? Why? <clears throat> Well, behind the scenes, we know from Wall Street Journal yesterday that they were um, there was private meetings at the ambassador level where the United States was telling Japan that you're about ready to lose northern Japan. So that didn't come from the State Department. It obviously came from the NRC. So the NRC knew but chose not to tell. Why? Oh, I think it's the same thing, Helen. I think it's uh, promoting nuclear power. They and... are evil. I can't say anything else. Look, in medicine, you have to have informed consent from a patient about every procedure you do, and you have to tell them what could happen, that you might rupture their esophagus, they might develop peritonitis. If, you know, the tube goes through the esophageal wall or whatever, you have to be honest. That's now legal. And yet here we have an industry which is pouring radiation into the atmosphere and the water, damaging people's genes for the rest of time. And they're lying, Arnie, they're lying. They can't, I mean, I, it's almost beyond by my belief as a doctor to imagine how these people can be so wicked. Well, they also turned off, the EPA here in the States, turned off the radiation monitors. Yeah. And we're discovering now that the air in Seattle... Yeah. Uh, compared to the air in Tokyo, it was only half. Uh, th there was almost half as much radioactive, oh, tiny particles um, called hot particles in the air in Seattle as it was in Tokyo, and yet we're turning off the United States radiation detectors. Why it, is it, the uh, uh, Why is the Environmental Protection Agency turning off the uh, the monitors? Uh, well, I, I wish I had a, a, a secret memo, but yeah. I think you've hit it on the head that there's a lot of industrial um, people um, who are concerned that they, they don't want this thing to, um, uh, to frighten people. But, in fact, I mean, you, you, you understand hot particles, and uh, the, uh, the air over Seattle was loaded with hot particles, as it was over Tokyo, in April and May. Okay, so Annie, explain to the audience what is a hot particle and what is it uh, composed of and what can it do once it gets into the body? Well, it's, a, it's very small. It's smaller than the thickness of a hair. But that has a lot of radioactive um, uh, atoms in it. And 
what can happen is it can get ingested um, through saliva, which is why everybody was supposed to water their spinach, but it can also get, get inhaled and, and stick in your lung. And in either case, it's got a charge. The other word for these, Helen, is fuel fleas. Oh, yes. Yeah, because they're charged and they jump. Do they so, jump? Yeah. You'll see them jump to a charged surface. So um, these fuel fleas or, or hot particles have made their way across the Pacific, and at least the data for the Pacific Northwest indicates very high concentrations. About the average person in Seattle, well, the average person in Tokyo breathed in about 10 hot particles a day, and the average person in Seattle breathed in six. So it, uh, they're really, despite the ocean in between, there really wasn't much difference. So are they composed of plutonium or... Stru- I mean, what are, what are the elements in the hot particles, Arnie? Well, we're seeing uh, plutonium, americium, and uranium, which are very heavy. Um, and we're also seeing uh, strontium and cesium, which are quite heavy but not as heavy, and all of which uh, emit a very powerful um, either a beta ray or an alpha particle. And they um, slam into the internal tissue and disgorge their energy in a very small area. But they do it and do it and do it again and again and again as they decay. So it, it's an irritant in your lung or an irritant in your, in your um, the bowel uh, or in your pancreas. Or uh, liver. Wind up or there. bone, yeah. Yes, correct. And so that constant irritation over time can cause a cancer. Well, the truth is if you inhale one millionth of a gram of plutonium and it stays in one place in your lung, and it does for, you know, months or years, irradiating a very small volume of cells, you're going to get cancer. But it takes, you know, 15 to 60 years for the cancer to develop for you to cough up your first amount of blood. Well, I think that's what the industry was counting on. You know what? By, by turning off the monitors and saying everything's fine, they realize that, um, you know, 30 years from now or 10 years from yeah. now, if you get a cancer, it's impossible to trace that back yeah. to Fukushima. So um, it was a good way of, you know, um, like an ostrich sticking her head in the sand, just hoping it would blow over. I can't believe it. It's like having a patient in the ICU in the intensive care unit turning off the monitors and saying, well, you don't really want to know what's happening to this patient. You know, we'd rather not, you know. It's just... No. It's It's... Beyond my capacity as a physician, Arnie, having taken the Hippocratic Oath, to understand what these characters think they are flaming well up to, I eh? it's now what I want to know from you, Arnie Gunderson, because you're on CNN, you're on all sorts of television programs. Is there a rising tide of deep concern and indeed anger amongst the American people about this? Um, this cover up. In the United States, more and more people have become concerned, especially in the last um, week. Yeah. Now, in addition to the doubling of um, the radiation estimate, and it's actually more like tripling, Helen, because they doubled what was released in the first week and are now you comparing that to what was estimates. released. Doubled the, the estimates. Doubled the estimates. All of the detectors were blown to smithereens. So, so it's all, all total this, estimates. They haven't, a, they haven't a clue how much got out or is still getting out, Right. That's correct. They have no idea. So how can they estimate if they have no monitors, they don't know what's happening, you know, and then they find, oh, my God, we've had a meltdown. Oh, my God, we've had another meltdown. How can they possibly estimate how much radiation escaped and is escaping into the air and water? How can they? Well, I think um, the, the difference between this accident and Chernobyl is that Scientists have the Internet, and they can be independent and yeah. share information. Yeah. We're seeing um, people are sending us automotive air filters from Japan, yeah. and we're examining those in the lab. And the, the Fukushima air filters are so incredibly radioactive that I hope the mechanics are wearing gloves when oh they're working on God. it. Oh, my God. And we're seeing, um, uh, even in Tokyo, the air filters in Tokyo are... 30 times less radioactive than Fukushima, but they're still highly radioactive. So, um, And what you know, elements have they got? What, are you measuring the strontium, the cesium, the plutonium, the americium, or not? Or just yes. 
you up. All of that. And so, well, initially, the first swipe is hot particles. And then once we find the hot particle, um, we can use a scanning electron microscope to hone mm -hmm. in on it and determine exactly what element it is. Um, and we've seen a witch's brew, you know, the cesium-134, 137, strontium, et cetera. So um, uh, they, are, they clearly were in the air in April and May um, because we've got the evidence now in yeah. the form of uh, automotive air filters. Okay, so now, and then I read <laughs> during the last week, Arnie, that the Japanese government have decided that people can eat the radioactive food because they need to keep their farmers settled and in business and keep them happy so people can eat the radioactive food. Did you read that report too? Yes, and, and the same with the school children, where they just suddenly said school kids can get what, what industrial workers can get. Um, it, it's absurd uh, and it's unconscionable. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was on the radio the very first week saying that they should evacuate pregnant women and young children out yeah. to 40 kilometers at least. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, they started at 10 and eventually got to 20. So they, they clearly did not want to provoke a panic. It is, I think in their mind it is better to deal with the medical issues a year or 10 out than it is to um, to lose money this year. So is it money? I mean, there's always a statement, you shouldn't cry fire in a crowded theatre uh, or you'll create panic and people, you know, trample over each other trying to get to the exit and kill each other in the process. Is it that sort of dynamic that they didn't want to create panic, A, or B, is it because they wanted not wanted people to know so that, that their investments, which are absolutely huge in nuclear in Japan and the United States, would not be threatened? Um, I think both. Oh. Uh, you know, I, I'm conscious when I'm on CNN or when I'm on um, this show. You know, I, I try to t temper my advice so it doesn't create a panic, but mm. yet I think you have to be informed at the same time. And if things are really bad... Mm. Uh, an informed population needs to know that. And that didn't happen, um, with the exception of, um, oh, probably two or three of us, me and Dave Lockbaum from Union of Concerned Scientists and one or two others. Um, all of the experts who were being paid by the industry wound up uh, saying, well, it, it, it's not going to be a big problem. They were lying. They well, they're, were, kicking the can, they're, they're kicking the can down the road, Helen. You know, they were saying that, that uh, 10 years from now, we'll figure it out. They're lying. I, I, they need to be indicted and jailed, obviously. That's what I would say as a physician. But let's get on to the next thing, Arnie. Here we are in the middle of the accident. We now learn that units 1, 2, and 3, which you predicted all along, have actually melted down. That unit 4 is very unstable with that huge fuel pool on top of the building full of huge amounts of radioactive materials and the building is tilting. Um, we have um, the molten fuel in units 1, 2 and 3 hitting the concrete floor. Possibly there could be a hydrogen explosion. We have the possibility of an aftershock, a big earthquake. Um, can you just sketch the possibilities of how another major accident could occur and now the winds have turned and they're blowing south over Japan and the rains are coming. Just sort of outline, illustrate um, um, the scenario, possible scenarios that could, could occur now from now on, Arnie Gunderson. Well, I think um, Unit 1 probably can't get any more worse than it is. Um, the fuel is melted through the nuclear reactor. It's lying on the floor and it boiling water as the water runs over it. Um, that water has become incredibly radioactive. It's essentially in contact with radioactive plutonium and uranium and, and, and all those elements. And uh, for all the units, they are simply running out of storage space. But Unit 1 um, is going to get massive bubbling hot uranium. It's going to gradually move down into the concrete, but I don't think there's enough energy to melt all the way through. But I, it really doesn't matter at this point because the radioactive material is leaving the containment. The containment has been breached. Mm. So um, Unit 2 
is um, is is just as bad. Um, there's a picture that came out yesterday of uh, scalding hot water boiling up through a hole in the floor on Unit One. That room, Helen, was um, uh, 400 R an hour. In other words, it's lethal in one hour. Okay, so uh, let me tell people what an R is. An R is a REM. REM is a measurement of absorbed radiation dose into the body. If you receive a dose between 250 and 500 rems, that is an LD50. In other words, a lethal dose for 50% of the population. You will die within a week or two with your hair falling out, vomiting and bleeding to death, like that man Litvinenko did, the Russian who was given some polonium. He died like that. So between 250 and 400 or 500. So you're saying, and that's in total, you're saying that they are measuring 400 rems per hour yes. at, that, at that site in Unit 1. Right, and similarly in Unit 2. Um, unit 2 still has the roof on, and it's so humid and so physically hot and so radioactively hot that nobody can go into it. Um, so Unit 1 and 2 are, as bad as they're going to get, are not getting any better but um, I, I don't think um, I think they're just going to continue to ooze liquid and spray steam into the environment for months to come. Mm-hmm. Unit three is a little bit different. Um, there's still a possibility of a steam explosion in unit three. How so? Um, How and, so? Well, because um, not all of the core melted through, and it, there's a chance of a large hunk of core falls into the water under it. Mm it could create a steam explosion. Um, unit 3's fuel pool and Unit 4's fuel pool are structurally so incredibly weak that I think my biggest fear now is a seismic aftershock. Mm. And if you remember the, the Sumatra um, earthquake of four, four or five years ago, that was a 9, just like Japan's, and there was a 8-6 three months later. Mm. So Japan is not out of the woods as far as major aftershocks. Unit 4 is tilting, and Unit 3 is pretty much bombed out and destroyed. And a major earthquake could cause those fuel pools to fall. My advice to my friends in Japan is if you hear that fuel pool has collapsed, leave. Mm. Um, Because there's there's no science here. No one ever thought of nuclear fuel lying on the ground um, and not being able to be cooled in in a nuclear fuel pool. So... Um, We are beyond the point where anyone has ever analyzed if the fuel pools collapse. So if there's a major earthquake that causes the buildings to topple, my advice is leave. Yeah, that's if you could get a plane out. I mean, (laughs) maybe you should leave now because can't you imagine? I mean, there will be panic if people understand and everyone lining up at the airport to get on planes and there won't be enough planes. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a major concern, and I don't know why TEPCO isn't frantically trying to reinforce that building. Obviously, it's so radioactive; it's difficult. But what this unit, unit four or unit three? Unit four. Uh, unit four. Right. Um, you know, frantically get in there and and shore it up with um, you know concrete and steel and mm. stuff like that mm. to prevent um, the unimaginable mm. return. But that has not happened. Um, and what what about the winds and, and the rain blowing now south over Japan? Yeah. Well, now the plants are emitting radiation every day. Mm. And that wind air. now, instead of heading out to sea predominantly, mm. is now heading uh, toward Tokyo. So um, we're seeing uh, hot particles on the roadways. We're seeing hot particles in Tokyo now. There's a group of people who are uh, monitoring um in lieu of uh, the government, there's a group of people out there monitoring radiation um, and, and are basically developing a map of what's really occurring in, um, in Tokyo. Just, yes, no, just two days ago, a university professor um, discovered plutonium a mile off-site in the soil. And um, at, at the same time... Um, a group of, uh, of inspectors found radiation in the ditches on the sides of the road to the tune of 10 millirem an hour, which is 200 times normal background. 
So it's fall. It's Zip falling away. onto the road, being washed into the ditches, and um, the ditches have become highly radioactive. Oh my God! What I don't understand, though, Annie, is why. I know. Yeah. Okay. So they were protecting their, as we'd say in Australia, protecting their asses. <laughs> So they didn't want people to know, but wouldn't you have thought that they would have invited the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, all the organisations in at the beginning to help them work out what on earth to do right at the start? Well, again, if you look at the IAEA's charter, it's to promote nuclear power. So they don't care and about safety, and, and, but their charter does say it's got to be safe. Yes, as well but as you know, it, as they have that split. They have that split charter where one they're promoting and two they're determining if it's safe, and and we both know that that doesn't uh, that doesn't work. So they're to, being uh, wicked. Yeah. They're being wicked too. I mean, really wicked. And the other thing is that what you just said, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was sitting a day or two after the whole thing started, saying they thought that the whole of the northern Japan could become uninhabitable. That's an amazing... Was that in the Wall Street Journal, Arnie? That was in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. yesterday. And it, it didn't say the NRC. It said the State Department was talking to the Japanese ambassador uh, and and trying to tell him the severity of the accident in, in his country. Now, the uh, State Department doesn't have radiation experts. They were obviously getting that information yeah, from, from the NRC. The, the, the NRC. Right. Well, why isn't Hillary Clinton being more honest? Well, Hillary Clinton, after Fukushima, entered a pact with the Japanese to buy more material. So again, the commercial, short-term commercial interests seem to be driving. Buy what sort of material? But, you know, food and uh, food and, <sighs> and, and trucks and cars. But it was, as I recall, predominantly um, uh, food and fish and things like that. It was an attempt to show the population yeah, right. of both countries. That everything was fine. How are we going to break through these people's psychic numbings, Arnie? I think the internet is the difference, Helen, and Do I you? hope it is. Oh. Um, I am constantly receiving reports that I pass on to other experts mm. Mm. Um, with data that over time will substantiate the magnitude of the releases, and um, then we can go back in and, and pin down uh, you know, what populations are at risk and hopefully, you know, give them the appropriate medical treatment. There's so that no medical it... treatment, Arnie. I'm sorry, but once people have been contaminated with radioactive material, you can't get it out of their bodies. There's no medical treatment. And then people are writing to me and saying, well, what do I eat? What do I feed my children? Well, you are right. You've been saying, you know, stay off milk products because milk, in fact does bioconcentrate radioactive iodine and strontium and cesium. That's right. But then they've got to eat, and the vegetables concentrated, and the fruit concentrates it, and it falls into the water. Um, the tea is, being, is concentrating the material in Japan now. Uh, you know, you can't run. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of biblical ghastliness that once it's happened... There's no retreat. You can't, there's nothing you can do to change it. Well, I'm most concerned about the fish. We're yeah. seeing, um, Woods Hole has said that the radioactive releases into the ocean are 10 times higher than the radioactive releases into the Baltic after, after Chernobyl. Yeah. And we're already seeing um, fish as far away as Hong Kong mm. being uh, detected with iodine. Mm. And, um, you know, high concentrations of cesium in fish as far away as uh, two to 300 kilometers now. Um, now, those fish will work their way up the food chain mm. into, you know, the tuna and the salmon and mm. the top of the food chain animals. And we'll see bioaccumulation over the next year uh, as the cesium and as the strontium works its way up the food chain. Well, and it's not just cesium and strontium, Arnie, that's pouring out into the ocean. I mean... Wouldn't there be more than a hundred different isotopes or radioactive elements like tellurium and zinc and calcium and all sorts of radioactive elements being poured in en masse into the ocean and there to bioconcentrate up through the crustaceans, no, the algae, the crustaceans, the little fish, the big fish, the tuna, the salmon? I mean, 
by orders of magnitude this bioconcentration at each step. So it's not just the cesium and strontium. Uh, would you like to name a few of the other elements that are not often talked about? Yeah, no, actually, I think you just nailed them, and, and polonium is another one. And um, I think, and, and again, we are not monitoring fish. And sooner or later, a ship in a tuna is going to fire off a radiation alarm as it enters the United States. Well, if they've got a radiation alarm, you know, because they don't... Well, our ports, our ports are mononitored for terrorists. I know, so, but... So, you know, we'll pick it up in a terrorist radiation oh, alarm. Think so? Uh, and we'll say, oh, my God, it's a tuna. Oh, I, I think oh. that will happen in the next year to year and a half. Well, what about the tuna being bought um, in Washington State, you know, or caught, or the fish, or... You know, because f fish swim thousands of miles. Um, and, and I hear that the EPA is not monitoring the fish that are being caught on the West Coast. Is that correct? No, they're not. Um, I think it's a little too early for measurable amounts. Yeah. The ocean currents have uh, not carried much of the radiation to the east, to the West Coast. Mm. And the bioaccumulation hasn't worked its way up the food chain too, too much. I, I think it's about a year out before we wind Do up you? with uh, contaminated fish on the west coast yeah. of the U.S. Now, what about you live in uh, Mass? Uh, no, you live in in Vermont, and radioactive fallout is being detected in Massachusetts and in Vermont in milk and and the like. Are you tell us your scenario if there really is another major aftershock or a collapse of one of the reactors? fuel, molten fuel masses and there's a steam explosion, a hydrogen explosion or whatever. And, you know, what wh what do you think could happen uh, in the United States or is it because the winds now have turned from blowing east to west across the US, U.S. to blowing south over Japan? You think that'll make the U.S. relatively safe um, because the climate climatic conditions have altered? Um, no, I, I think you said it right earlier. You can run, but you can't hide at this mm. point. Mm. Um, you know, that these particles at a, a micron or two or three microns are small enough that they will get up in the jet stream and, 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 and carry the way into the States and into Europe. Um, mm. So I, you know, I'm not convinced that, um, you know, things like cesium and strontium, but that whole witch's brew that you discussed mm. um, won't, uh, won't get here. Now, you know, will you be able to stand outside with a radiation detector and say, oh, my God, there's a lot? No, it's all about hot particles and ingesting a, uh, a particle that then causes a lot of local damage in a lung or a GI tract or a pancreas or, or, or a bone um, that, that leads to a cancer. It's, um, um, but it's never going to be something where you can stand outside with your Geiger counter and no. detect it, which what? makes it so insidious. Oh, it's insidious and cryptogenic and silent and insidious. What what do you call them, those hot particles, nuclear fleas? Fuel fleas. Fuel fleas, yeah, that's that's the, the language that nuclear engineers use. What gets me is that nuclear engineers know all this stuff, and I found it fascinating, your latest um, video, Arnie, you were talking about evacuation and how the NRC calculates how much radiation will get out if there's a meltdown. And you said that they determine that if there's a meltdown, only 1% of the melted material will, will escape, right? And then of that, I don't know, they cut it down and cut it down so finely. And using those totally artificial estimates, they then work out who should be evacuated from where and from how far out from the plant. I mean, that was an amazing thing to me, Arnie. Well, no, thank you. Yeah, the website is Fairwinds for your listeners with an E in the middle. Uh, and, and, yeah, um, they, the, the industry and the NRC got together and came up with uh, assumptions, and they are purely um, uh, guesses at how much radiation can be released. And um, at each step along the way, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller to the point that we have very, very small um, evacuation zones. And that's all about money. You know, it's all about um, a plan to remove people from a very close in distance is obviously a lot cheaper than a plan to go out to, I'm suggesting, 80 kilometers. 
you're suggesting 80 kilometres of evacuation zone, but how could you possibly evacuate people around Indian Point from 80 kilometres around? You know, you've you've got Westchester and, you know, highly populated areas reaching right down to New York. Well, I mean, ever uh, since talk the about 19th, gridlock. Everybody has known since the 70s that locating Indian Point that close to to uh, New York City yeah. was a mistake. And yet, you know, we're, we're considering giving them a 20-year license extension. Uh, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it didn't make a lot of sense 40 years ago to do it, and why do we want to double down on that bet uh, for another 20? Well, Arnie, we know that there's a big movement now um, of people living around Indian Point and indeed in, in Manhattan to oppose uh, Indian Point. They actually want it shut down. Uh, not the lifetime extended. Um, do you think that that movement's going to be powerful enough with the NRC and the powers that be to, to do that? Well, the NRC is, um, has never not approved a license extension. I know, so, I know. Um, but, but in the case of Indian Point, there's uh, the state of New York is against it, yeah. and, the, and, and the governor of New York is against it. So yeah. for the first time, there's a political um, coalition that may uh, may affect whether that plant runs for an extra 20 years. Are you going to be able to close down Vermont Yankee, seeing that your governor wants to and the Senate's voted for closing it down, uh, and yet there's a lawsuit from Energy who owns the, the blasted thing to keep it going? Well, the people of Vermont have spoken, mm -hmm. and, and that's that the unit should be shut down. Um, Energy is suing the state, and, and now it's a legal battle, and... Uh, uh, I I don't really want to speculate no. on, on on what a federal judge is going to decide. No. Um, right in your bones, Arnie Gunderson, nuclear engineer. Uh, give us your sort of gut feeling, emotional reaction to what is now going on and has been going on in Fukushima, from all your knowledge and background and understanding. Well, I guess there's a bunch of feelings. A deep sadness for the people off-site, mm. uh, an incredible respect for the, the workers who are risking their lives. Mm. I mean, um, um, these, these people know that the likelihood of a cancer is, is much, much increased, and yet they go to work every day. Um, but, you know, at, at its core, um, I, I feel... Um, deep respect for Mother Nature. And I, and I have really come to the understanding that we are not smart enough to outsmart Mother Nature. There will be something thrown at a power plant that we haven't anticipated, mm. whether it's a tsunami, an earthquake, a hurricane, a tornado, uh, or God knows what. But um, man is not smart enough to, um, uh, to manage one of these um, uh, given what Mother Nature can throw at us. So you used to think, as a nuclear engineer, that man was smart enough to master Mother Nature, did you? Oh yeah, when I um, when I left college, the, the math behind nuclear power is uh, is enthralling. I mean, um, if uh, now I have a saying, uh, sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. <laughs> oh, that's too true, honey. That's too true. The, the, what we really have to do now is to rise above the wave of money and power. You know, the uh, the last thing we haven't discussed is President Obama's absolute fixation on nuclear power. Do you want to just briefly mention? Well, his largest campaign contributor early on was Exelon, and they have um, 17 nuclear power plants. So it doesn't surprise me that the advisors he chose are, are pro-nuclear. Um, I don't think he's getting good advice. Um, the, the money for new nukes doesn't make any sense. Um, they are so astronomically costly in comparison to alternative energy and smart grids that I don't know why we're doing it. Um, on, on closing the old ones, uh, I'm sure, again, that gets to the point where all of his advisors have a vested in interest in that outcome. Yeah, but wouldn't you think that man is intelligent enough, Arnie, and intuitive enough, and he's a father of two little daughters he adores, to really get it? 
I think he relies on his advisors and compared to an economy in the tank and uh, um, you know two wars and things like that, he doesn't spend a lot of time on his energy policy. In fact, energy policy is the root of the economic problems and the root yep. of the of the wars. Yep. But I, I don't think in Washington they see it that way. I think they see the energy policy as a, a separate deal. In fact, it's at the bottom of all our problems. Well, I think we should close with a statement from President Jefferson that is always apt. An informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. And Arne Gunderson... You are an outstanding informer, teacher, lecturer. Uh, You have been at the forefront of this dreadful, ghastly accident right from the start, and I respect you very much for that, Arnie. Without you, yeah, David Lockbaum's done great work too, but you've been right there. And I would like to say to the viewers that Arnie does it all for free. And, you know, he's he's not being paid to do this, whereas the uh, the nuclear people... They get paid. So if anyone has a bit of spare cash uh, and would like to help to save the world, it would definitely help Arnie and Maggie in the wonderful um, work they're doing. Well, thank you, Helen. There's a donate button on the Fairwind site. Yep, good. Arnie, thank you, my love. And we will be uh, interviewing you again in a few weeks for another really ghastly update, I suppose. Oh, I hope not. No. <laughs> No. Thank you very much. Okay, love to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye-bye. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Arnie Gunderson, an energy advisor with 39 years' experience of nuclear power engineering in the United States.